Toy Story 2 is a 1999 American computer animated comedy adventure film produced by Pixar and released by Walt Disney Pictures. Directed by John Lasseter and co-directed by Leon Critch and Ash Brannan, it is the sequel to the 1995 film Toy Story. In the film, Woody is stolen by a toy collector, prompting Buzz Lightyear and his friends to vow to rescue him. But Woody is then tempted by the idea of immortality in a museum. Many of the original characters and voices from Toy Story return for this sequel, and several new characters, including Jesse, Barbie, Stinky Pete and Mrs. Potato Head, are introduced. Disney initially envisioned the film as a direct-to-video sequel. Toy Story 2 began production in a building separated from Pixar, on a small scale, as most of the main Pixar staff were busy working on A Bug's life. When story reels proved promising, Disney upgraded the film to theatrical release, but Pixar was unhappy with the film's quality. Lasseter and the story team redeveloped the entire plot in one weekend. Although most Pixar features take years to develop, the established release date could not be moved and the production schedule for Toy Story 2 was compressed into nine months. Despite production struggles, Toy Story 2 opened in November 1999 to wildly successful box office numbers, eventually grossing over $485 million and highly positive critical reviews. Toy Story 2 has been considered by critics to be one of the few sequels to outshine the original, and it continues to be featured frequently on lists of the greatest animated films ever made. The film has seen multiple home media releases and a theatrical 3D re-release in 2009, ten years after its initial release. The film's success led to the release of Toy Story 3, which was also critically and commercially successful. Plot Woody prepares to go to cowboy camp with Andy, but Andy inadvertently nearly rips Woody's right arm off. Andy decides to leave Woody behind, and Andy's mother puts Woody on a shelf. The next day, Woody discovers that Wheezy, a penguin squeaky toy, has been shelved for months due to a broken squeaker. When Andy's mother puts Wheezy in a yard sale, Woody rescues him, only to be stolen by a greedy toy collector, who takes him to his apartment. Buzz Lightyear and all of Andy's other toys identify the thief from a commercial as Alma Quiggin, the owner of a toy store called Al's Toy Barn. Buzz, Ham, Mr. Potato Head, Slinky Dog, and Rex all set out to rescue Woody. At Al's apartment, Woody learns that he is a valuable collectible based on a 1950s TV show called Woody's Roundup and is set to be sold to a toy museum in Tokyo. While the other toys from the show, Jesse, Woody's Horse Bullseye, and Stinky Pete, are excited about going. Woody wants to return home because he is still one of Andy's toys. Jesse is upset because the museum is only interested in the collection if Woody is in it since they will be returned to storage without him. The next morning, a cleaner repairs his arm and he learns that Jesse was once the beloved toy of a child named Emily, who eventually outgrew her and gave her away. Stinky Pete warns him that the same fate awaits him when Andy grows up, whereas he will last forever in the museum. This convinces Woody to stay, now believing that all toys eventually get discarded by their owners. Meanwhile, Buzz and the other toys reach Al's toy barn. While searching for Woody, Buzz is imprisoned into a cardboard box by another Buzz Lightyear action figure with a utility belt, who thinks that he is a real space ranger. The new Buzz joins the other toys, who mistake him as their Buzz. After discovering Al's plan, they make their way to his apartment while Buzz escapes and pursues them, accidentally freeing an Emperor Zerg toy, who immediately goes after him, intent on destroying him. After the toys find Woody, Buzz rejoins them and proves that he is Andy's Buzz, but Woody refuses to go home. Buzz reminds Woody of a toy's true purpose, and warns him that in the museum, he will never be played with by a child again. Having foiled Woody's escape the previous night, he reveals that he wants to go to Japan because he was never sold to children, allowing Al to take the Roundup toys with him. 
Andy's toys follow him while the new Buzz chooses to remain behind with Zerg, who confronts them on the elevator and reveals himself as Buzz's father. Accompanied by three toy aliens, they steal a Pizza Planet delivery truck and follow Al to an airport, where they enter the baggage handling system and free Woody. Stinky Pete rips Woody's arm again while preventing his escape, but is stuffed into a little girl's baby backpack by Andy's toys to teach him a lesson of what it is like to be played with. They free Bullseye, only for Jesse to end up on the plane bound for Japan. Assisted by Buzz and Bullseye, Woody frees Jesse and the toys find their way home. When Andy returns home from camp, he accepts Jesse, Bullseye, and the aliens as his new toys, thinking his mother bought them, and repairs Woody's torn arm. Meanwhile, Al's business has suffered due to his failure to sell the Roundup toys. Woody tells Buzz that he is not worried about Andy discarding him because, when he does, they will still have each other for company. Meanwhile, Wheezy's squeaker has been fixed and performs a Frank Sinatra-style version of You've Got a Friend in Me. Cast, Tom Hanks as Sheriff Woody, Tim Allen as Buzz Lightyear, Joan Cusick as Jesse, Kelsey Grammer as Stinky Pete, Don Rickles as Mr. Potato Head, Jim Varney as Slinky Dog, Wallace Shawn as Rex, John Ratzenberger as Ham, Annie Potts as Bo Peep, Estelle U. Harris as Mrs. Potato Head, Wayne Knight as Alma Quiggan, John Morris as Andy, Laurie Metcalf as Andes Mom, R. Leomi as Sarge, Jodie Benson as Barbie, Jonathan Harris as Jerry the Cleaner, Joe Rant as Wheezy and Heimlich, Jeff Pigeon as Squeeze Toy Aliens, Andrew Stanton as Zerg. Production Development talk of a sequel to Toy Story began around a month after the film's opening, in December 1995. A few days after the original film's release, Lasseter was traveling with his family and found a young boy clutching a Woody doll at an airport. Lasseter described how the boy's excitement to show it to his father touched him deeply. Lasseter realized that his character no longer belonged to him only, but rather it belonged to others, as well. The memory was a defining factor in the production of Toy Story 2, with Lasseter moved to create a great film for that child and for everyone else who loved the characters. Ed Catmull, Lasseter, and Ralph Guggenheim visited Joe Roth, successor to recently ousted Jeffrey Katzenberg as chairman of Walt Disney Studios. Shortly afterward, Roth was pleased and embraced the idea of a sequel. Disney had recently begun making direct-to-video sequels to its successful features, and Roth wanted to handle the Toy Story sequel this way, as well. Prior releases, such as 1994's Aladdin sequel, The Return of Jafar, had returned an estimated $100 million in profits. Initially, everything regarding the sequel was uncertain at first. Whether stars Tom Hanks and Tim Allen would be available and affordable, what the story premise would be, and even whether the film would be computer animated at Pixar or traditionally at Walt Disney Feature Animation, Lasseter regarded the project as a chance to groom new directing talent, as top choices were already immersed in other projects. Instead, Lasseter turned to Ash Brannan, a young directing animator on Toy Story whose work he admired. Brannan, a Callitz graduate, joined the Toy Story team in 1993. Disney and Pixar officially announced the sequel in a press release on March 12, 1997. Story Lasseter's intention with the sequel was to respect the original film and create that world again. The story originated with him wondering what a toy would find upsetting, how a toy would feel if it were not played with by a child or, worse, a child growing out of a toy. Brownon suggested the idea of a yard sale where the collector recognizes Woody as a rare artifact. The concept of Woody as a collectible set came from the draft story of Eight in Toy Christmas, an original half-hour special pitched by Pixar to Disney in 1990. The obsessive toy collector named Alma Quiggan, who had appeared in a draft of Toy Story but was later expunged, was inserted into the film. Lasseter claimed that Al was inspired by himself, 
Secondary characters in Wood to Set were inspired by 1950s cowboy shows for children, such as Howdy Doody and Hopalong Cassidy. The development of Jesse was kindled by Lassiter's wife Nancy, who pressed him to include a strong female character in the sequel, one with more substance than Bo Peep. The scope for the original Toy Story was basic and only extended over two residential homes. Whereas Toy Story 2 has been described by Anchorage as something all over the map. To make the project ready for theaters, Lasseter would need to add 12 minutes or so of material and strengthen what was already there. The extra material would be a challenge, since it could not be mere padding. It would have to feel as if it had always been there, an organic part of the film. With the scheduled delivery date less than a year away, Lasseter called Stanton, Dr. Joe Rand, and some Disney Story people to his house for a weekend. There, he hosted what he called a Story Summit, a crash exercise that would yield a finished story in just two days. Back at the office that Monday, Lasseter assembled the company in a screening room and pitched the revised version of Toy Story 2 from exposition to resolution. Story elements were recycled from the original drafts of the first Toy Story. The original film's original opening sequence featured a Buzz Lightyear cartoon playing on television, which evolved into the Buzz Lightyear video game that would be shown in the opening Toy Story 2. A deleted scene from Toy Story, featuring Woody having a nightmare involving him being thrown into a trash can, was incorporated in a milder form for depicting Woody's fear of losing Andy. The idea of a squeak toy penguin with a broken squeaker also resurfaced from an early version of Toy Story. Animation as the story approached the production stage in early 1997, it was unclear whether Pixar would produce the film, as the entire team of 300 was busy working on A Bug's Life for a 1998 release. The Interactive Products Group, with a staff of 95, had its own animators, art department, and engineers. Under intense time pressure, they had put out two successful CD-ROM titles the previous year, the Toy Story Animated Storybook and the Toy Story Activity Center. Between the two products, the group had created as much original animation as there was in Toy Story itself. Steve Jobs made the decision to shut down the computer game's operation and the staff became the initial core of the Toy Story 2 production team. Before the switch from direct-to-video to feature film, the Toy Story 2 crew had been on its own, placed in a new building that was well separated from the rest of the company by railroad tracks. We were just the small film and we were off playing in our sandbox, co-producer Karen Jackson said. Lasseter looked closely at every shot that had already been animated and called for tweaks throughout. The film reused digital elements from Toy Story Bit, true to the company's prevailing culture of perfectionism. It reused less of Toy Story than might be expected. Character models received major upgrades internally and shaders went through revisions to bring about subtle improvements. The team freely borrowed models from other productions, such as Jerry from Pixar's 1997 short Jerry's Game, who became the cleaner in Toy Story 2. Supervising animator Glenn McQueen inspired the animators to do spectacular work in the short amount of time given, assigning different shots to suit each animator's strengths. Whilst producing Toy Story, the crew was careful in creating new locations, working within available technology at that time. By production on Toy Story 2, technology had advanced farther to allow more complicated camera shots than were possible in the first film. In making the sequel, the team at Pixar did not want to stray too far from the first film's look but the company had developed a lot of new software since the first feature had been completed. To achieve the dust visible after Woody is placed on top of a shelf, the crew was faced with the challenge of animating dust, an incredibly difficult task. After much experimentation, a tiny particle of dust was animated and the computer distributed that image throughout the entire shelf. 
Over 2 million dust particles are in place on the shelf in the completed film. Controversy and troubled production Production problems were evident from the beginning. Disney soon became unhappy with the pace of the work on the film and demanded in June 1997 that Guggenheim be replaced as producer, and Pixar complied. As a result, Karen Jackson and Ellen Plotkin, associate producers, moved up into the roles of co-producers. Lasseter would remain fully preoccupied with Abug's life until it wrapped in the fall. Once available, he took over directing duties and added Lee Unkrich as co-director. Unkrich, also fresh from supervising edited duties on Abug's life, would focus on layout and cinematography, while Brannon would be credited as co-director. In November 1997, Disney executives Roth and Peter Schneider viewed the film's story reels, with some finished animation, in a screening room at Pixar. They were impressed with the quality of work and became interested in releasing Toy Story 2 in theaters. In addition to the unexpected artistic caliber, there were other reasons that made the case for a theatrical release more compelling. The economics of a director video Pixar release were not working as well as hoped thanks to the higher salaries of the crew. After negotiations, Jobs and Roth agreed that the split of costs and profits for Toy Story 2 would follow the model of a newly created five-film deal, but Toy Story 2 would not count as one of the five films. Disney had bargained in the contract for five original features, not sequels thus assuring five sets of new characters for its theme parks and merchandise. Jobs gathered the crew and announced the change in plans for the film on February 5, 1998. The work done on the film to date was nearly lost in 1998 when one of the animators, while routinely clearing SIM files, accidentally started a deletion of the root folder of the Toy Story 2 assets on Pixar's internal servers. Associate Technical Director Oren Jacobs was one of the first to notice as character models disappeared from their works in progress. They shut down the file servers but had lost 90% of the last two years of work, and the backups were found to have failed some time previously. The film was saved when technical director Galen Sussman, who had been working from home to take care of her newborn child, revealed she likely had backups of the assets on her home computer. The Pixar team was able to recover nearly all of the lost assets save for a few recent days of work, allowing the film to proceed. Despite the miracle, many of the creative staff at Pixar were not happy with how the sequel was turning out. Lasseter, upon returning from the European promotion of A-Bug's Life, watched the development reels and agreed that it was not working. Pixar met with Disney, telling them that the film would have to be redone. Disney disagreed, and noted that Pixar did not have enough time to remake the film before its established release date. Pixar decided that they simply could not allow the film to be released in its existing state, and asked Lasseter to take over the production. Lasseter agreed, and recruited the first film's creative team to redevelop the story. To meet Disney's deadline, Pixar had to complete the entire film in nine months. Unkrich, concerned with the dwindling amount of time remaining, asked Jobs whether the release date could be pushed back. Jobs explained that there was no choice, presumably in reference to the film's licensees and marketing partners, who were getting toys and promotions ready. Brown and focused on development, story and animation, Lasseter was in charge of art, modeling and lighting, and Uncritch oversaw editorial and layout. Since they met Jaylee to discuss their progress with each other, the boundaries of their responsibilities overlapped. As was common with Pixar features, the production became difficult as delivery dates loomed and hours inevitably became longer. Still, Toy Story 2, with its highly compressed production schedule, was especially trying. While hard work and long hours were common to the team by that point, running flat out on Toy Story 2 for month after month began to take a toll. The overwork spun out into carpal tunnel syndrome for some animators, and repetitive strain injuries for others. 
Catmill would later disclose that a full third of the staff ended up with some form of RSI by the time the film was finished. Pixar did not encourage long hours, and, in fact, set limits on how many hours employees could work by approving or disapproving over time. An employee's self-imposed compulsion to excel often trumped any other constraints and was especially common to younger employees. In one instance, an animator had forgotten to drop his child off at daycare one morning and, in a mental haze, forgot the baby in the back seat of his car in the parking lot. Although quick action by rescue workers headed off the worst, the incident became a horrible indicator that some on the crew were working too hard, wrote David Price in his 2008 book The Pixar Touch. Music Toy Story 2 An original Walt Disney Records soundtrack is the original score soundtrack album to Toy Story 2. Although out of print in the U.S., the CD is available in the U.S. as an import and all but one song is available digitally. All songs written and composed by Randy Newman. Randy Newman wrote two new songs for Toy Story 2 as well as the complete original score, When She Loved Me, performed by Sarah McLaughlin, used for the flashback montage in which Jessie experiences being loved forgotten, then abandoned by her owner, Emily. The song was nominated at the Academy Awards in 2000 for Best Original Song, though the award went to Phil Collins for You'll Be In My Heart from another Disney animated film Tarzan. Woody's Roundup, performed by Riders in the Sky, theme song for the Woody's Roundup TV show, and also used in the end credit music. The film carried over one song from Toy Story, You've Got a Friend in Me, sung at different points during the film by Tom Hanks and Robert Golette.